Good evening. Um, welcome to the Karl Renner Institute. Uh, my name is Maria Malchnik. I'm the director of uh, the Renner Institute and I'm very happy um, uh, that all of you came. We also have a live stream. Um, so hello to everybody who is watching uh, on the internet. We are having a discussion today uh, which is actually a part of two, two bigger projects. Um, the first project is a conference that started yesterday here at the Renner Institute uh, on the initiative of our partners from the Czech Republic. Um, we, together with the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, short FEPS, invited the Social Democratic Foundations of uh, the CEE region here to Vienna. And uh, we had around 20 participants from, I think, 11 countries uh, who came here yesterday and we had uh, the conference the whole day to discuss common challenges in the region and uh, possible projects, possible topics to work together. Um, um, and also the, uh, the goal was also to find, to build allies, to get to know each other. And I think um, uh, I'm very uh, happy about the outcome of the conference. I'm happy to, um, uh, th that we, uh, everybody of us got to know each other. And I think we will, um, and I'm sure we will continue our conversation. And there's a second project. Um, we, as, a, as the Renner Institute, also wanted to take this chance, uh, to take the chance to have so many um, progressives from so many different countries uh, here in Vienna to work on our narrative, to work on the social democratic narrative. Um, as many of you know, we, we or the, uh, the Austrian social democracy, are not facing uh, exactly quiet times uh, at the moment. We um, uh, we suffered a painful defeat at the general elections a month ago, and um, there there are multiple reasons for that. But uh, one major challenge we face is finding a coherent narrative of like meaning and identity on top of our, uh, in my opinion, very smart policy ideas. Um, we experienced decades of uh, a dominant neoliberal narrative that consisted of market, uh, competition, individuality. Uh, we, we, um, we experienced this narrative all over Europe, actually more than all over Europe. And after this narrative eroded, after the crisis and after several um, um, uh, challenges, the right-wing populists managed to like jump into the field with a very strong counter-narrative. Um, and this was a narrative of um, homogenous national communities that are supposed to protect the people from the negative um, uh, effects of globalization and of uh, the market dynamics, um, for example. So the challenge is, and our goal is, uh, has to be to work on a progressive narrative that um, finds a space a part of a neoliberal narrative and a right-wing populist narrative of, of nationalism. Um, therefore, the SPÖ installed so-called future labs, or Zukunftslabore, uh, and I would like to see this debate, or a part of this debate at least, um, to be a kind of an unofficial start of these um, future labs. We um, we are documenting uh, the key uh, uh, the key issues we were, we will debate today, and also the um, uh, the key uh, uh, elements of like uh, the speakers we have here today, um, and we hope to harvest and also learn from them. So so much uh, from uh, the Austrian Social Democracy. 
Um, before we start with the panel, I'm happy to welcome Laszlo Andor here today. He is the Secretary General of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, which is like the social democratic political foundation on the European level and our main partner uh, on the on the European level. Laszlo has been has also been, of course. Uh, a former Hungarian EU Commissioner for Employment and uh, Social Policy. Um, and yes, thank you for the cooperation because we are uh, having this conference and also this event today um, together. Uh, thank you very much for that um, and for being here today, Laszlo. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Maria, ladies and gentlemen, it is for me a pleasure to be in Vienna and thank you very much for organizing this uh, debate tonight and uh, playing um, the role of uh, the host in this crucial debate. In my view, discussing the East-West divide in the European Union is absolutely a crucial uh, question. The European Union is probably more divided than most of us would be ready to recognize. Um, <laughs> At the same time, we also have to highlight that the East-West asymmetry or imbalance, as economists would prefer to say, um, is not the only one. Very often we do not only speak about an East-West asymmetry, but also the North-South imbalance. And you can have a very interesting discussion about which one is more significant, which one is more um, burdensome for the European Union. Uh, the difference, um, I would say, is that in most of the discussion, the reference to the East-West question is a political one. It's about constitutional question. It's about the political values of the European Union. It's about the doubts that the Eastern countries, the so-called new member states, have really made a sustainable convergence on the all European political values which are established also in the treaties of uh, the European Union. The North-South divide appears to be uh, a little bit different. Uh, there are much less doubts about the political commitment, but there are doubts about the capacity of the European Union to integrate uh, diverse models of different economies, different countries into the same monetary union. Uh, but that just um, uh, 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 makes our task uh, more difficult. Uh, that just makes uh, our task uh, a little bit more difficult when we want to find a kind of uniform solution to all these divides asymmetries. Because on the one hand, um, diversity is something we celebrate. Linguistic, cultural uh, diversity is something which the European Union is supposed to celebrate, but diversity is something different than divergence. Whether we speak about economic divergence or political divergence, divergence related to the institutional or constitutional uh, questions. And very often, unfortunately, due to the Hungarian situation, due to the Polish situation, the East-West divergence is discussed in the dimension of uh, uh, political and constitutional issues, and I would be the last one to deny the relevance of, uh, of, of this. FEBS in Brussels, um, of course, um, is incorporating these questions into the research agenda. FEBS um, has a role, and I would say a privileged capacity in Brussels, um, among the EU institutions, to promote research, the public debate, and also political education in this field, and ensure that the European political debate and the European political process um, takes into account um, the existing uh, tensions, the existing asymmetries in a way that the reform of the policies, the reform of the institutions would lead to better outcomes, including overcoming um, these divides 
which the discussion will focus on today. I'm absolutely convinced, for example, that um, the divide which we speak about uh, today, the East-West issue, is not only a question of values and political institutions, it's also a question of cohesion in a broader sense. What is the experience behind? What is the experience of the 30-year transition in our economy since the fall of the so-called Iron Curtain? And to what extent the 15 years experience inside the European Union was sufficient to overcome some of the anomalies that have been created in the 1990s with the transition uh, to the market economy under a free market laissez-faire uh, paradigm. So, um, in my view, we can only answer the questions of today by looking into the developments of yesterday with an interest in not only a few years, but also a longer time horizon. But our interest should be to, to find answers for the decades ahead. So we, we need to also try to think with um, the mindset of the young generation, which would need to ensure that the European Union of tomorrow would be better balanced and create more opportunities fair working and living conditions for uh, the future. So with this introduction, and um, indeed um, um, with uh, strong support on behalf of FEPS and the interest to, to, uh, to learn um, about um, uh, your views, I would like to uh, give back uh, the floor um, to uh, the distinguished discussants of today's panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> I would like to ask the panelists to come. Yes, <laughs> please. Take a seat wherever you feel like. No, no. So... Let me introduce uh, our guests tonight. Um, uh, to my right is uh, Mr. Attila Ark, uh, Professor Emeritus at the Corvinus University of Budapest. Um, he recently published a book on um, the fall of democracy in Eastern Europe. Um, on the very right is uh, Paul Schmidt. Uh, Paul Schmidt is uh, the Secretary General of the Austrian Society for European Politics, which is a think tank um, uh, uh, for European politics in, here in Vienna. Um, to my left is Maria Skora from uh, Das Progressive Zentrum in Berlin. She used to, or she's uh, an expert uh, on the on international politics, but especially on the Visegrad um, countries. And to my very left is Magdalena Zelasko, um, who is the director of the Let's See Film Festival in Vienna. C E E. Let's see. <laughs> um, nice. I would like to start with Maria. Um, Maria, you're writing, uh, as I said, a lot about the countries of the Visegrad group. How do you see the developments there? Um, I mean, the, what we discussed today, uh, there have been promising developments recently. Uh, there were the uh, regional elections in Hungary where the opposition could uh, take over Budapest. Uh, there was a, um, a, co a progressive coalition in Poland um, uh, with a very strong result uh, in the last elections. How did, uh, do you see that there is kind of a movement? And uh, yeah, um, do you see the possibility of like establishing a strong progressive movement also in this area? And if yes, how? Yeah, thank you. 
Um, well, there, there are many questions in one, I would say, and I'll try to be brief. Uh, good evening, thank you for the invitation. Um, yeah, um, I think, well, if we look at the Visegrad, it's far more diverse than we think. Well, Czechia, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary, th four countries uh, with four different political um, uh, cultures and, and uh, traditions. However, two of them are very present in the public debate, especially uh, abroad in, on a European level. Uh, Hungary and Poland, of course, because of the developments there, democratic backsliding, and amazing success of uh, the Law and Justice Party in Poland and, and Viktor Orban uh, in, in Hungary. Um, I would say um, I wouldn't like to maybe talk too much about Hungary having a distinguished uh, expert specialist and native from the... But you, you're more than welcome to do that. I feel really uh, uh, not in the position to, to elaborate too much on that. But um, I think, yeah, um, last Sunday, probably uh, not last Sunday, actually 10 days ago, you all know, uh, there was local elections in uh, Hungary as well as parliamentary elections in Poland. And in fact, we have seen, we have observed a spark of hope. Whereas I'm not so sure about Hungary because it's the victory of the opposition in Budapest, uh, whereas the rest of the country, from what I understand, is still a stronghold, uh, more or less, of the Fidesz uh, party. Uh, but in Poland, indeed, the left-wing coalition, the joint effort of three parties, three generation of, of uh, progressive actors um, has made it back to the parliament. Uh, for those of you who may not know, 2015 elections have left the Polish parliament without the representation of the left. So, well, that's already a success, even though if it's only 12 and a half percent, as far as I remember, of all votes, uh, that's already something that gives hope and is a qualitative change. But uh, you were asking about the perspective of building a progressive movement and how to do it. And I would suggest, how about we look, um, um, okay, that's uh, a bit um, maybe controversial, but how about we look on those who already are successful and let's look about the law and, uh, at the Law and Justice Party, uh, which definitely celebrated a, their victory um, on October 13th. 43% uh, of the Law and Justice Party and its two coalition uh, partners, junior coalition partners, two satellites, is perhaps not what they were uh, counting for. The opinion polls, some of the opinion polls before the elections were uh, giving the Law and Justice Party even 48, 49% of, of support. And comparing to Viktor Orban as our point of reference, 43 might be a little... Um, lame result, <laughs> especially if we think about Viktor Orban's 52% uh, in uh, 2010. But yes, unquestionably, there is strong and mobilized support for the um, law and justice, and that's hence also the agenda. Never, nevertheless, there were some snippy comments after, after the election results were um, uh, published that Polish people have sold democracy for social transfers um, because the law and justice actually is known for having kept their election promise and, and promises for 2015 and having uh, fulfilled what they uh, obliged themselves to fulfill. I think it's a, not a fair uh, comment to say, um, where first of all, um, there is not such a uni united uh, unit as Polish, uh, Polish people itself. Also, when taking raw numbers uh, of votes, um, the s f fragmented opposition actually uh, won more votes than uh, the Law and Justice Party, won almost one million more votes. However, the Don't method used in uh, translating the election results into the seats in Parliament has given the Law and Justice Policy Party absolute majority in that Parliament. But, um, back to the point, um, let's look why the Law and Justice Party is actually so popular and why they are winning. Uh, first of all, I've already mentioned, as they promised 2015 to introduce um, generous uh, social policy program and abandon that narrative of Poland being a developing country, poor country, country still working their way up. Um, the promise of more fair redistribution and actually using the wealth of the country that the country has um, accumulated during the, uh, the last 10 years. They really delivered what they promised. And I think many voters have, for the first time in a long time, felt taken seriously. 
And the second point is that these generous social programs, they really improve the lives of many people, many Polish families. And after uh, eight years of uh, liberal or even neoliberal governments that were pursuing that uh, idea of a small state, of, of cheap state, uh, that was a um, definitive, definitive difference uh, to shrink the socioeconomic gaps within the Polish society. And I think, of course, there, that, that promise also came with or many negative changes as a package uh, with um, um, dismantling judiciary or taking over public media. But at the end of the day, I think uh, it resonates with some part of Polish elect electorate. Um, that um, improving my own situation or my family's situation is far more important than um, such abstract uh, ideas like um, judiciary, democracy, and so on. And um, I don't, uh, perhaps one could think it's cynical. I don't think it's cynical. I think it's pragmatic. Uh, and um, to sum up, um, I think there cannot be democracy without solidarity. And by that, I mean, we have to, as social democracy, I think that's a lesson we could learn from the electoral um, victory of, of uh, the social, uh, of the law and justice, that what's really important is to um, take a step back and uh, define the challenges and problems of post-capitalism, of, 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 of the capitalism that we are living now, and to try to and develop the agenda that would appeal to um, broader sectors of the society and also put it forward in a language that is uh, possible to uh, understand. Um, of course, right-wing or far-right, uh, right-wing populists are also employing um, rhetorics based on, based on hate or a very negative um, message, um, excluding be it refugees, LGBT community and so on. That, uh, in my opinion, we are absolutely not allowed to do. And that's why preaching love is always more, more, more difficult than preaching hate. However, we should try and um, be it... Um, yeah, I would say um, there are social cultural factors and all the polit identity politics that is very important in decomposing why right-wing populism or liberal tendencies are, are popular. But I think as social democracy, we have to go back to the roots and ask the question about fair and modern redistribution models in our countries. Thank you very much. I have a brief follow-up uh, question. Do you think the Polish people don't believe that the Social Democrats would fight for them as much as the uh, Law and Justice Party does? Because you said uh, the Law, uh, Law and Justice um, promised uh, a very progressive social model. The Social Democrats didn't? It's not progressive, it's actually very archaic because um, uh, social policy based on social transfers is like uh, very um, so 70s or so 60s. But uh, so it's a very ar archaic model of, a co of, of social policy. However, in the short run before it, um, uh, inflation kicked in, it really made a difference uh, to many, many families. Um, I, well, social demo, well, social Democrats, right now the left-wing coalition, as I, as I mentioned, three generations and three different party, left-wing parties or social liberal parties that um, are present in the parliament. So it's on the one hand, like the Polish Syriza, the ra Razem, which is more far right and maybe um, bottom-up movement, that's the um, uh, social democracy of the SLD, uh, um, um, left democratic alliance, and then the new movement of Robert Piedron and his social liberal um, uh, movement or party. I well, ask myself a question. This is already three different visions of Poland, of the welfare state. I ask myself a question if they will be first and most um, able to meet in the center and develop um, a consistent and coherent uh, vision for what there should be implemented. But to answer your question, I think it was also difficult for uh, progressive actors, for progressive figures to get through to the general public in the last four years, not having representative in the parliament. So the issue of strategy and policy, uniting on this and then 
uh, fast forward, charge ahead with appealing to the citizens and showing the alternative. We don't have to live in a generous but intolerant right wing state. Uh, we can um, politics can be different and Poland can be different. Thank you, um, Attila Ak. You wrote um, a book. Uh, it's called. You can show it to. Uh, we can show it to. It's called "Declining Democracy in East Central Europe." You've been working on democracy questions in uh, uh, in the region for a long time. Um, what are your um, What is your view on the current situation and um, also, as I know that you've been working on the on questions of narratives, um, uh, that's what I read on um, in your uh, in your CV. Um, do you see a, do you see a space for a progressive social democratic project in the region, and um, and what is a possible political focus? I would like to go against the mainstream here. Uh, I think it's uh, very misleading if we are asking about special reasons for the Orban regime in Hungary or for the electoral success of peace uh, in Poland and so on. Uh, my book is about the region and there are no country chapters. But there is a long analysis about the economic progress, uh, about the social transformation, about the political systems, and so on, of the region. Because this is a common history, and this is a common... Uh, this book is a self-criticism. Uh, in the 90s, I published uh, several books in the West uh, about the same region. And it was full of optimism, I would say even euphoria. This hasn't happened to us. This is indeed a failure in several ways. And if we are discussing East-West divide, then we haven't forget about the East-West divide within East Central Europe. If you draw a line, from dance, from north to south, you will see that all the countries are partitioned. Please check the list of not two regions, the official EU publications. You will see that some parts of our countries, all of them, belong to west of the east. Some other parts, very characteristically also in Poland, to East of East. These are two worlds apart. And those who live in the East of the East uh, have a much lower civilization uh, than 30 years ago. They are absolute losers. So if we are asking the questions as scholars or scientists, why these uh, uh, right-wing movements or uh, uh, you can uh, have a lot of terms, uh, of course uh, we overuse the term of, uh, uh, of uh, deviation from the European mainstream and, and the questions like that. Uh, we have to realize that that project but started in the early 90s we call it systemic change. And also that project, it started 15 years ago with the EU membership, has been a failure. And the only way out if we face the facts. Let me uh, show what way it was a failure and what is the main problem. Namely, uh, the East-West divide would have uh, deserved some kind of a special treatment of the new member states. And if you start a competition with stronger states and weaker states, you can see the result in advance. 
and this is what happened. Common conditions, please compete, it doesn't work. Cohesion policy waters failure. Uh, at the end of the last year, the EU published a long documentary about upward convergence is a failure. It's not my opinion, it's a, uh, it's a thick documentation book from the EU. And not just from that side, what I have just mentioned, that failure that east of the east, but there is a very important other distinction, namely catching up quantitatively or catching up qualitatively. Namely, if we specify as economists, first of all, there is a GDP-based approach. You can point out that several countries have some progress in the GDP. Poland, thank you. Yes. But, but this is just reaching the past of the older member states, not the present, not the new structures. We are the low skill, low cost periphery of the European Union. It is not a progress, even if there is some progress in the GDP. If you look at the figures of the education, healthcare, research, and development, you will see that all these countries, please read it, all the statistics are there, it's much below what means the modern production, what means the modern way of life. So we are trying to reach the past of Austria, Germany, and all that. All reproducing that structures in GDP-wise, GDP doesn't mean anything nowadays for the economics. Well-being, yes. Human investment, social contact. This is the modern economy. And all these countries are in worse situation than they were 10 years ago. Look at the investment in education. Look in the investment uh, for social care and, and health care and so on. You will see that there are very crude figures. These have been worsening. So, if we go back to that situation 30 years ago, we shouldn't forget that there was indeed a scholar who realized the situation. It called Ralph Dahlendorf. He issued warnings several times, but we didn't listen to, including myself. We were optimistic. I say even more euphoric. What he said was that there are three different lines of development, very easy legal political change. Uh, let's use his words, six months, no problem. Some kind of introduction of, of market economy, okay, okay, six years. But changing the societies, he said, 60 years. We have eaten up half of it, 30 years. And uh, I have to tell you that there is a deep credibility crisis in our countries. European project has gone and we are weaker and weaker and therefore people feeling weak, they say that they are proud European citizens. It is not a contradiction. Because they are weak and they don't see a future themselves. Therefore, they say that we are belonging to Europe. Because they need, in this world of desecuritization, some kind of security. And Europe is the last security for my people in Budapest or for your people in Ljubljana and elsewhere. 
I have just recently read a paper about a, a Slovenian situation, and I was simply shocked about the people situation and approach to the European narrative. So, yes, we can have a narrative, but it's a narrative can't be as it was the import of Western model of development, meaning that, that we can repeat uh, the Western model of catching up by copying it and believing that we will do it uh, in a shortened way. Uh, in my book, I try to uh, describe what I call uh, Juncker paradox. Juncker paradox is that the general situation of the EU is that we have always cycles, crises, we have always a lot of problems. Therefore, we marginalize certain problems. This is what you can see describing the five years of the Juncker Commission. Uh, what are the Juncker's answers to the East-West divide? Yes, yes, I understand. Please wait. And these counterproductive situation is the Juncker uh, paradox. The situation is much worse than it was five years ago due to the benign neglect of the European Commission and uh, the European Union. Not realizing that special cases, not just in that part of the world I am talking about, but in other parts of the world, uh, what Fritz uh, Sharp uh, told, uh, judicial transition, judicial integration doesn't work. Doesn't work. We have facade institutions in Poland, in Slovakia, everywhere. Facade democracies. Nothing behind. This is just on the paper, on the Constitution. The first six months. And democracy has been emptied in our part of the world. Completely. Therefore, Juncker paradox may be continued as a uh, Leiden paradox. It's okay. Again, saying, now Brexit, tomorrow this and that. Why to uh, deal with these issues, unimportant. And these people are not uh, grateful to us uh, for this integration process. The integration philosophy was mistaken. Uh, there is a Copenhagen learning process. This is not my turn. Namely, learning that uh, from the very beginning of the Copenhagen criteria, this process has not been well planned. There is a large literature about that. So, narrative. Uh, it is not my narrative. Please take the paper. Uh, what I just mentioned, December uh, uh, 2018, EU publication, upward convergence is needed. But this needs also the specificity, solving not all part of the world. The Greek issue may be so much different uh, from the uh, Baltic situation. EU shouldn't have this benign neglect about the region specificities, and that can be a solution if we have an upward convergence. The European Policy Center published a paper just some months ago, and uh, a very nice scholar whom I like very much, maybe mispronouncing his name, Emanulidis, Yanis Emanulidis, wrote a terrible sentence. And sorry, finishing with that, he said that the uh, member states of the European Union is looking like being on different planets. And it is his sentence and his words. So if you would like to stop it, please stop the Juncker paradox, benign neglectance, not dealing with 
specialties. This is one region with the same problems. Zeeman is saying the same stupidities as Orban. They are from the same school. So, uh, to deal with special issues in a special way, understanding the problem, as a political scientist, I stop here, I can have key words for, for you, the political participation, economic participation, real life behind uh, the democratic uh, institutions. This has been hopelessly emptied in our countries. You just see the scenery and nothing is behind. Hungary, uh, as we said, but also Poland is very far from any kind of democracy. What we have there, it is not democracy. Even if there are some small steps, uh, we had a big victory on the 13th of October, okay, but this is still not a democracy. This is an autocracy in which uh, there are some elements. Elections. Uh, okay, so uh, it's, uh, uh, thank you for the invitation again. And I know that in, in the anti Greece, those uh, messenger boys uh, were killed who brought with them uh, bad messages. So I hope that I can escape tomorrow morning to Budapest. We usually don't do it here. Killing the messenger. Um, so, Paul, um, so we jump uh, over the border uh, to the. Um, we, we sat together before, and then we were we were talking about as a Viennese. Uh, are you Western European or are you Central European? And uh, we said we. we it's somewhere in between because Vienna is so much more east than Prague. So the concept of east and west, the geographical <laughs> concept of east and west is a bit mixed up. But uh, anyways, uh, from, an, from an Austrian point of view, um, how do you see this east-west divide? Do you, did you hear about the Juncker paradox before? <laughs> um, do, you, um, do you share Ms. Hark's, uh views um, and um, yes and how do you see it from your uh, you, from the point of your work thank you very much for the question and for the invitation um, this is this is an interesting discussion and uh, I think Attila was very nice to finish uh, his intervention uh, with this sentence that please don't kill the messenger we won't we never do but i think it's important to bring in a a conflictive um, critical but constructive position in order to discuss the issues um, and i'm very much tempted to to respond to what you have been saying of course um i i do share some of the arguments uh, in particular the one that you have mentioned that the planning of EU enlargement uh, had uh, many downturns and, and um, today it, it would have been done differently maybe. But on the other hand, the question also is what would have been the cost of, of non-enlargement? I think that's also an, an interesting question to look at. Um, on the uh, euphoria, I think that's, that, uh, that is a a very important point you made, um, which is um, still um, something which we have to confront because in general, uh, on the different planets within the European Union, because we're all on a different planet, I agree, um, expectation management is, is not well done, I think, because the way national politicians talk about European developments, um, works with an expectation management as if if we meet on a weekend on Monday everything will be solved and I think that's uh, that that would need a, a, a reality check because um, this this will never happen um, I also very much agree that 
East-West divide is, of course, a great title, but it does not reflect reality. Because as you have mentioned, there's a West-East divide, there's an East-East-East divide within the region, and there's very much a pattern which we also see uh, in other member states where you have a strong divide between the capitals, the cities, the urban areas, and the rural areas very much. And this is, for example, uh, if you look at, at, at Slovakia, I think, the, but not only, of course, but, but this is something which we, um, which, which we see and which we also have to deal with in, 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 in other member states, of course. Um, I wouldn't say that it has been a failure, and, I mean, but I agree with the argument that the catching up process is it's much slower than, than it was actually promised to be and that, there are, that there's a lot of uh, disillusion, disillusion with, this, um, um, with, with, with these developments. But the question is, I mean, we, we, we cannot change what we've been doing in the past. The question is what we do now and how can we actually um, improve the situation. Um, I agree with the with with your argument that uh, if we look at GDP and if you just look at it from the economic point of view and from traditional way of of uh, defining uh, the economic development of of countries, uh, the picture would be different because we would see that convergence is actually happening, growth rates are higher, but uh, it's not about quantity; it's also about quality and the well-being and the social dimension and who reaps the benefits of this of this integration. Um, and uh, what are the costs, what are the benefits, and what what do people actually uh, benefit from it? I don't agree with the Juncker paradox um, because uh, it's 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 easy to 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 blame the European Commission, but if you look at it in detail, I mean, why not criticize them? Of course we should, but if you look at it in in detail, um, there were and there are and there will be many many proposals on how to propose improve certain situations and how to um, to manage challenges uh, which we face but um, those mo some of them legislative proposals are then blocked uh, by, by, by the by the council so I think other member states are the ones that we should be talking about if you if you think of just um, uh, his, his um, saying goodbye in the European Parliament Juncker was very clear that uh, the fact that uh, Greece is still a member of the Eurozone is um, due to um, a strong insistence uh, by the European Commission and some EU member states, but other EU member states would have been very comfortable with having Greece leaving uh, the Euro area. Um, if you look at uh, the, the issue of uh, starting enlargement negotiations, uh, you have a similar picture. Criteria, criteria is fulfilled. European Commission proposes, and um, and some member states have their have their veto. So I think um, it's a more of a, of a a member state a paradox, um, which talk a lot, but then action proves them proves their rhetoric wrong. And I think that's something uh, we should look at. And again, that's where you're right. Uh, member states are very much on a different planets and on a different planet and the planets differ from member state to member state and they're very much in their national public sphere and Juncker called them once uh, weekend Europeans and I think that's true because um, national politics do have a European responsibility which they don't uh, spend enough. I remember um, a, a Greek colleague who said maybe it's even the case that many national governments are just not fit to to, to actually um, live up to their European responsibility. But this is the structure which we have, and the question is uh, not so much the analysis of the current situation, but how do we get out of this? Um, there are many things that divide East and West uh, that are regional divisions, in the East and in the West and no South divide, as, as Laszlo said. Um, maybe what we are lacking here is um, a sense of um, better understanding and listening more and just talking more to each other 
to understand where we are and how this can actually be dealt with. And maybe the focus should be uh, very much on how to translate economic successes on paper into social progress uh, on the ground. And that might be, might be very naive, but I think um, that's one way to go. But that doesn't, that doesn't uh, keep us from uh, scrutinizing very carefully what is going on uh, with, um, in terms of European values and, and the rule of law. I think that's, that's crucial. There's no room for compromise there. Um, but the way we deal with it could be different, but, but I think um, if we compromise there, we will, we will probably, it will probably be, be the end of, of European integration, which is actually based on rules and, and values. Um, and I think uh, there, there, there was one um, smart Austrian um, actor who once said that member states um, that form that together form uh, the European Union, they have signed up to something, but they don't really remember what they signed up to. And I think that's something that we have to, to constantly remind them and discuss with them, and with, in particular, the civil society, how, how these, what, what the member states actually signed up for and how this can be, can be implemented and what is the reasoning behind it. I think there's no, no, no room for complacency there. We have to constantly repeat ourselves because it's not self-evident that things would stay as, as they are. And my last point would be, um, but I'm now, um, I'm, uh, I'm, it, it's true that I haven't really haven't really answered your question, but <laughs> but my my anyway I think there will be other rounds. But but my my last point would be um, that uh, because because I mentioned the sensibility and the better understanding of each other and the way of talking to each other, and uh, to give you one example to 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 show what what I mean, uh, we we usually do on a regular basis opinion polls. And there's one opinion poll uh, regarding future enlargements. And we always ask what the public opinion is on this and that country becoming member of the European Union, just to get an idea of how the public feels about it. And the public perception is, is very negative regarding future enlargement. It wasn't like that um, with, with the last enlargements in 2004 and 2007. Um, and this is one of the few examples where the Austrian government the Austrian governments, no matter what uh, what coalition we talk about, they they have one of the few examples where they don't follow public opinion, and they actually have a an, an interest to reach out to uh, southeastern Europe, which is of course also an economic interest, an historic interest, geographical interest, etc. But they stick to it because they say it's something which we do on a medium term and the public opinion is a short-term thing and it might be improving. Um, and that's, that's interesting to see. And I remember going to Bratislava to meet one of our uh, colleagues there from, from another um, um, institute which we work with in Bratislava. And I told him about this, this data and I told him that, you know, um, the, worst, uh, the, the worst result is, of course, uh, Welcome to Austria. It's it's always Turkey, but but then then Albania doesn't really have a good public image here, and and then his answer was, and I still remember it today. His answer was, well, you know, at least Albania does have an image in Austria, but we are as 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 Slovakia, we're just uh, less than an hour away, and no one in Austria really cares about us. No one really comes to Bratislava to talk to us, and it seems like two different planets apart from the different planets which we have in our own countries. And I think that's something very striking. And I thought about it and I said, well, he's, he, he's right. And, um, and that's something I think we have to change. And I, I might be naive, but, but I still think that uh, with all the failures and all the problems and all the challenges which we have, with these divisions, um, this, this is nothing that we can give up on, but this is something that we have to build on the successes that we see and have to make sure that, that these failures are repaired and that the wider public actually 
also understands the, the value added, not only economically, but also politically, of, of being part of the European integration process. Thank you. I think you have to switch off your... Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, you answered many questions, so I'm satisfied. <laughs> um, just to also to contextualize your critique towards uh, member states and the Council. Of course, we were all very disappointed last week when the European Council didn't agree on opening the accession talks with North Macedonia and uh, Albania. And this was, um, uh, this was actually France's um, fault. And uh, um, yes, I think you, uh, what we saw last week was that there are limits and the, uh, and the European Council and like the power of the member states. Um, if, if there is n not a common um, vision and, uh, and some member states can't live up to that, it's a problem. Um, you, also, the, you already mentioned the uh, civil society and I would like to switch to, to Magdalena, Magdalena Celasco. Um, for social dem for social democracy, so, uh, civil society initiatives and cultural in initiatives are always important allies, um, especially in regions uh, or countries um, where the party structures are not that strong. Because in in um, many cases, people who are active in civil society movements are, are highly educated, highly motivated, and have uh, strong capacities to, um, uh, to also fight for a free, equal, and solidary societies. Um, which potential um, strategies for like both nationalism and neoliberalism do you see, and especially in the in the CE area? Uh, thank you for the question and for the invitation. Um, indeed, um, uh, there is a lot to do for civil societies in uh, in the region because um, uh, the governments are coming uh, with uh, new pictures of enemies almost every week or every month. So, of course, um, the civil society um, reacts uh, with the positive image and with protests. Um, and this is uh, what the international media also noticed, that there are a lot uh, of people on the streets and um, um, the methods of uh, protests are very creative sometimes. Um, however, um, it's not possible to, uh, to talk um, about Hungary, Poland and Slovakia and so on uh, as a one region because every country has um, own systems and sometimes um, the civil societies succeed uh, and sometimes not. Uh, for example, um, now in Hungary, uh, when the Central European University moved to Vienna, or rather to say was banned uh, to Vienna, uh, now um, another NGOs are targeted by the government. So there is a um, uh, try to um, force them to register it, um, as a foreign uh, financed institutions as soon as they receive more than 23,000 euros, I think. So um, it's not um, so much deal you could think, but uh, of course in the heads of the people it will be like they are receiving foreign money so they uh, serve foreign interest and we can um, remember what happened in Russia when a similar law was uh, um, also invented uh, that uh, there were hundreds of NGOs they closed because uh, they lost the trust from the society. They were seen like uh, foreign agents in the country. Um, for example, in Poland, um, it's not that case so far, but um, I have the feeling that the, um, sometimes um, some special NGOs are picked up as examples. And um, one of the biggest enemies of the um, government is uh, the biggest charity uh, called, um, uh, you can translate it like a big orchestra of um, Christmas charity with almost 30 years of tradition. 
and they are collecting money, uh, among others, for hospitals, and they are the biggest of that kind in Poland, the biggest charity action. And uh, what happened uh, this year, um, the mayor of Gdańsk, uh, who was uh, collecting money all the day, was stabbed on the stage uh, and murdered. He died uh, one day after. Um, it's important to say um, that um, um, the head of the charity and also this mayor uh, were critic of the government. Um, however, they did it in a very um, subtle way, I would say. They never uh, used the language of hate. And um, so, um, for example, um, both uh, received uh, so-called certificates of date uh, from, from um, youth organizations. Um, and um, it was very uh, widely uh, reported um, internationally and a lot of people um, were sure something will happen. It cannot be like that, the, that the innocent people are killed and it, um, it's a part of politics because a lot of people uh, connected this to this um, really aggressive language and not really something happened. So. Um, we see now the same language and, and the same uh, enemies. Um, while, for example, in Slovakia, after um, the journalist um, Jan Kusak was murdered, it, um, it um, changed the system. So now the new president uh, was elected mainly because uh, there were massive protests and um, suddenly um, new topics were possible. Um, so um, uh, we will see how it um, will um, uh, develop in that countries. Uh, what is uh, good uh, that now in the um, era of internet, of social media, everyone can be part of, uh, of civil society and it's much, much easier nowadays to, to be part of it. Um, for example, um, again, um, after this, uh, tragic death in Gdańsk, and Gdańsk was also kind of um, one of the biggest symbol in Poland because uh, it's the birthplace of Solidarność and it's a topic um, where, for example, um, um, it, it's, it, this mayor was, for example, uh, very open towards migrants and, and uh, he wanted uh, to take um, some certain um, number of migrants and welcomed them in the, the Ming Daisk. Um, and there was an action when uh, one of the biggest charity uh, on Facebook happened when the people decided to collect money uh, to uh, fill this uh, charity box of this murdered mayor. And it was really one of the biggest action ever. I, I don't really, I think it was the biggest one in the region when they collected several million euros and um, and make it and did it happen um, so um, and again uh, social media and crowdfunding uh, campaigns uh, when you um, see uh, of course the artists and journalists are more prominent parts of civil society but of course um, everyone can be um, a lot um, of artists know they uh, won't receive um, funding for their projects, so they appeal to so civil society and make a very important project uh, happen. And I see them also as a very uh, important part of um, civil movement. Um, maybe you have heard um, about the film, uh, which was produced uh, also a few months ago and premiered shortly because, uh, before European election. Uh, and it uh, thematized uh, the topic of pedophilia in the Polish church. And the director collected um, all the money um, in a crowdfunding campaign. And um, again, a lot of people uh, were sure uh, when this documentary, um, which uh, was already seen by 25 million uh, viewers on YouTube, uh, completely for free, uh, if it uh, will be released uh, shortly before um, election, something will happen. And then uh, what you can see now, uh, this attacks um, against LGBT society, this was um, the answer uh, from, um, from the party because um, um, 
suddenly um, kind of new enemy had to be found. So they targeted LGBT. And um, this is also something what will uh, be uh, present um, in the Polish uh, reality uh, for a long time, I'm afraid. And uh, because we also know that uh, the leaders um, in the region are very well connected and the, uh, they are copying uh, the ideas. Probably this will be also a strong topic um, in Hungary or in Czech Republic um, because um, this is something what um, completely um, illustrates um, this uh, divide between uh, East and West, uh, between um, model of uh, traditional family and even uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski a um, uh, few months ago repeated that the normal family for him is a family with mother and father and not with two mothers and two fathers. So he uh, plays this opposites uh, quite well. And of course, um, uh, there are some uh, reactions as well, but, uh, but so far not so strong. Um, and... Um, Yes, so we will um, see what, what will happen. And um, um, also my festival, which I uh, was, uh, which was, um, which is in Vienna since tw 2012, I saw it um, as well as a part of uh, civil um, society because uh, it was uh, done mainly uh, with volunteering work. And uh, for me, it was important uh, since so many migrants from Central and Eastern Europe are living um, in Vienna and uh, before the um, 2015, um, from 10 uh, biggest um, groups uh, of migrants living in Vienna, uh, nine of them were from Central Eastern Europe. The biggest, of course, was uh, from Germany. So uh, for me, it was important to bring the people together and to um, also fight, fight against stereotypes because there were a lot of stereotypes also um, before the Eastern enlargement. Um, some of them were spoken and some of them were unspoken. Um, the pictures on, on television when you saw the Romania or Poland, like a rural uh, uh, landscape and uh, it was, uh, or, or um, masses of, of people looking for a job abroad. Um, and um, only one example of why it's important uh, to, to appeal to the society uh, with culture. Um, we uh, were, the were the first festival in Austria uh, which presented um, documentary about Oleg Sensov. Um, and um, after the screening, um, there was a letter from Austrian directors, a letter of support for Oleg Sensov. And of course, um, there were a lot of initiatives um, in, in Europe and in the world, but um, all together um, were able, I hope I have the feeling to, to do something and uh, to, to help to release him. Um, and um, a solution which um, also could help uh, to, to bring people together and to um, offer some different pictures and not um, enemies only, it's, um, in my opinion, education of, of young people and uh, to reaching them because once they uh, leave school, they will be independent and they probably never will find uh, a way to, to some culture um, offer. But uh, when, uh, uh, when they are at school and they uh, visit um, screening and discussions with people, they are really European. And also to be European is for me not only to, um, to admire European Union without uh, any doubts, but also to, to say what is uh, wrong and uh, what could be done. Um, so it's the way to, um, to make them feel um, this um, European identity. And I can remember before the European election, we offered a series of uh, youth cinema together with European Commission. And even in Austria, uh, in one city, um, I was there at the discussion and um, the children, like or the teenies with 15, they had no idea why it's important to be in European Union and what European Union gave them. And after one hour discussion, uh, 
you had the feeling they um, they know already. <laughs> nice story. So we have an audience full of experts, um, and I would suggest uh, like to open the floor towards uh, the audience to give you the possibility to ask questions and to also to intervene. Is anybody? Yes, please. Please, uh, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, yeah, my name's Carl Owens. Um, I'm actually from the UK, so I'm not sure if anyone else here is from the UK. Um, I just read actually we're going to have a European debate on the 12th of December, you know, otherwise known as a general election, which will be the last opportunity we have to exit the Brexit. Um, so, let's see. <laughs> My comment relates to my comment relates to a couple of things that have already been mentioned. So I'd like to know what people think and about specifically the idea of a um, a monolithic social democratic party. Does it still work? And you particularly mentioned like the three parties in Poland. Uh, which are covering different social groups, different generations. And if it doesn't work, then one answer for the Austrian Social Democrats is quite simple. Split. All right. So that's one, one comment. The, the second comment I would make, perhaps it's more of a, an observation, but in terms of education and young people, educating young people, I think that's a really critical thing. Um, Corbynism, not everyone likes it. I, I appreciate that. But the young people that are involved in Corbynism um, arrived there via the student protests of 2010. And it was the expansion of higher education that exposed these young people to a different set of critical, critical values, let's say critical thinking. And you know th this seems to me to be a point that gets a bit lost. So you know the UK has many problems, but it, for the, the change from 20 or 30 years ago is enormous. You know we have young people who are engaged now and coming at politics from a radical and non far right perspective. And uh, this this is one of the things that's changed for the better. So um, th those are the sort of, I know if they're, they're kind of questions, I think, and I'm interested in what people think. Cheers. Thank you very much. Um, maybe, Maria, do you want to comment on the question of uh, of the party? Yeah, if, if, if social democracy can still, um, um, like, unite... Um, if I understand you rightly, like um, uh, urban liberals and also other milieus in in society. Sure. I have to start with a disclaimer that I'm not a political scientist. Uh, I'm a sociologist. That's why uh, I most happily talk about societies. <laughs> but I'll try, though, <laughs> as a personal opinion. Um, actually, uh, that's a very interesting uh, point, and I'm happy that we have more so political scientists here, which perhaps could talk more about the future of political parties. But, um, uh, yeah, the left-wing coalition was successful in Poland in these elections because they were a coalition, <laughs> not because they were fragmented. Um, they came together and we were uh, able to um, win enough votes to make it to the parliament, uh, representing different um, agendas and attracting different voters. But so there is this un unity in diversity. So uh, I don't know how to answer that question, but I guess the electoral logic tells us uh, the more you cover, the better. But at the same time, um, how to do it? And I'm, I'm as you know, I live and work in Germany, so uh, we can also talk about the SPD if anybody feels like it, which uh, uh, also suffers um, big losses of voters. Um, it's very sad to see it, but um, 
we have another party in Germany which is very successful, and these are the Greens. And the Greens are very eclectic, and um, I think that's maybe uh, one of the answers uh, or one of the possible um, sources of inspiration to dare be more eclectic and to dare reaching out to electorates uh, which not necessarily would be the, um, the genuine one. Um, I don't know if that answers um, your question. That was what I think about it as a sociologist, not political scientist. It's one, per one perspective. Maybe Joe can... Um, uh, say something on like social democracy um, in his concluding remarks. I will introduce him. No, not not now, but afterwards. Uh, we have Uwe and Hannes, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Uwe Obtenögel. I'm German, but I'm here as vice president of FEPS in Brussels. Um, I wanted to comment on Attila Ark's uh, constatation that the integration process was a failure. Um, I don't quite share this view, even though I see many of your points. Uh, but since we are looking for a counter-narrative, a progressive counter-narrative to the predominant one of the last 30 years, uh, I think we have to uh, jointly look back on the expectations and on the misperceptions we may have had all together in the early 1990s. Uh, it's not by coincidence that Helmut Kohl was convinced that Germany, East Germany, would turn into flourishing landscapes in 10 to 15 years. And what happened, in fact, was that it uh, ended up in industrial deserts yeah? and not in flourishing landscapes. So I think there was a joint misperception in East and West because I think in the Central and Eastern European countries, there was um, a hope to get freedom, democracy, and the welfare state in a package. But what you got in the first place was freedom, democracy, and neoliberal capitalism. And nobody could imagine what this is, neoliberal capitalism. Even the successful Western European countries with strong social democratic parties didn't imagine what this kind of capitalism did to our welfare states when you go back to 1982 when Helmut Schmidt lost to Helmut Kohl in Germany. Yeah? So I would say it's nothing special when you say you have this east-west divide inside the countries. Yeah? I mean, you have it between Western Slovakia and Eastern Slovakia. It was uh, explained to us today, you have it in Poland, between the Western part of Poland and Eastern Poland. You have it in Hungary to some extent. I would uh, rather call it uh, um, uh, regional uh, inequalities um, than necessarily East-West divide. In Italy, it accompanies Italy for its whole existence after the Second World War. If you go to Milan, it's like Munich or even richer. And if you go to the Mezzogiorno, it's like in Morocco. Yeah? yeah, that's it. So it's not so special. I think the problem we have uh, and why convergence didn't function, which is a precondition to a joint narrative of Europe, because we had a certain kind of capitalism that didn't want to deliver on this. They wanted to deliver on something else. They wanted to deliver on individualism. That's part of the problem we have in our days, that we have by far in every region, in all over Europe, not only in Central and Eastern Europe, a, an exaggerated liberalism. We had a propaganda slogan of a media company in Germany in the 90s, which said, Greed is cool. Greed is cool. Yeah? Greed is not cool at all, as we know. But solidarity would be cool. Yeah? But that was, so to speak, the culmination point of a certain perception of capitalism, financial capitalism, which brought us to the Lehman crisis and the aftermath. So my point is that I think the anniversary uh, we have now, eight, nine, 89, 90, yeah? Um, is a good opportunity to jointly look for what went wrong 
yeah, and uh, to then see uh, where we have things in common, because I also think we do have many things in common. To finish, so uh, I agree to the, say, economic part of your analysis, uh, Attila, but not necessarily to um, the socio-psychological part of uh, your criticism, because I think the young generation arrived in Europe, also the young generation in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, Hannes Svoboda. Yeah, Hannes Svoboda. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, for your statements, which were all very interesting, two comments. The one on, on Poland and the, the question you said, I don't want to go on the, on the Labour Party. The one thing is to get new people young people into the party, the other thing is to win elections. And hopefully Labour Party does win elections, but that's the, the major point. On Poland, the question was that the party was not, or the left was no longer in the parliament because it split, it was split before. Uh, we had in, in, the, in the parliamentary group, we had three different Polish left, more or less uh, from the same party or nearly the same party, and I attended some of the party conferences of the left. It was totally bureaucratic, too old, not open for young ideas, uh, not open for LGTBs or whatever issues. So the left was a disaster, uh, and disaster in, in, in splitting itself. So this was the problem, and that they are not together is not because uh, they are differentiated, but because they were together in some way, at least in some basic ideas. And I think uh, why should not social democracy uh, give a um, cohesive picture if, if the right wing is doing it? Of course, it has to put the same, the, the real questions. One issue, of course, and this is not, Poland was an extreme case, but uh, honestly also there's, uh, of course, a lady from, from Slovakia here who knows much better and others. Many of these parties did not um, overcome the heritage of the past and went into a new normal which should not be normal. Not saying that the parties in the West were all perfect, no, not at all. The second question to what Attila said, and I don't have to repeat, but just as Udo has been said, the real question is, was, was there an alternative? Was there really an alternative? It is not, as it's very often pictured, you, Attila, have been more cautious on that, the West overtook the East. When we spoke about, for example, European Parliament in, in our group, about um, labor rights, about labor rights from truck drivers, the Western representative said, we have to en enlarge and enhance labor rights, basic rights, uh, limiting the hours uh, people have, can, may go with a truck through Europe. And the Eastern colleagues said, no, 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 we have to have freedom. We have to have uh, uh, jobs and therefore don't be so social oriented. So it was some, sometimes uh, at the adverse case. Um, and uh, many of the representatives, even of the left, you can say so-called left, were much more liberal minded in, uh, in uh, promoting uh, neoliberal capitalism than we in the West. And the real problem is that overall, the, the development or the, the enlargement and the accession came in a phase where this neoliberal interpretation of capitalism was the dominant one. And of course, in the West, there was strong trade unions who could cushion it a bit and mitigate it a bit. These strong unions did not exist in the, in the East. Uh, in the West, we had more rules-based orientation, for example, rules based on opening hours of shops. In the East, it was prominent to say, our shops are open 24 hours, you can buy all the time, and only to show some of the examples. So yes, I agree, you, they, you made a very good analysis, and we should really uh, think about it. But the real question was um, not so much a difference between East and West, but a common uh, philosophy which was partly, of course, represented by the Commission, but much more by member states. By member states, including some of the social democrats, let's be honest, who promoted this kind of development of deregulation and many other issues. The Commission was, 
in many aspects, even more for regulation. Laszlo could, could uh, tell many stories about that. So I think we should um, a bit differentiate what, what you said. I mean, I don't, uh, don't deny the analysis, but then really the question, can you, could you have avoided it? When Cole was mentioned, when I said, look, it's crazy to say, uh, you in, 10, in 10 years you will uh, call us that the membership should be, I don't much earlier for Poland, for example. Then the answer was, but we like to hear it, that we are very soon like the West. Uh, to be critical and to be skeptical that it could work was not, uh, people didn't want to, to accept that. So I think we should a bit differentiate, uh, but nevertheless, I think what you have said as analysis this separation between different parts of the society is, is very true. It's less true for us, but still also in the West, it, it is one of our big problems. Look to France, to the Yellow Vests and to other demonstrations. Thank you. Attila, you were addressed. Well, uh, to be brief, I would say that it deserved uh, to come to uh, Vienna because I have at least one ally, Uwe. Uh, he said uh, in different terms what I could continue uh, with the other slogan. You may dislike it, but the fact is that in the whole European Union, the economic Europe has defeated the political Europe. That's the story. This is your story. Uh, defeated uh, the political Europe more in our countries. Let's have some theoretical addendum and a recent political fact. Namely, uh, when, uh, when uh, the systemic change uh, happened in our country, there was a power vacuum. So uh, the Western firms came I'm sorry a bit for not, not being modest enough. When we were, I say, uh, in the common position, since I was there. So uh, we couldn't have any resistance. There was an alternative. This was a modern imported to our countries. And we were lame. We were not able to resist any pressure coming from the West. And we on the left were very much Western-minded and what came from the West should have been good for us. This was our, our perception. And we thought, this is also a book, that okay, okay, this is too bad, but it would be transitory. It has become the structure of the new system. And uh, talking, sorry, still about Hungary, there is a saying, there is a saying nowadays in Hungary that there is a protecting arm behind Orban, a very strong one. This is the German government. Mm -hmm. German this is the German government. Indeed, uh, this is a shared uh, sovereignty. They have been making a compromise. Multinationals could do everything in Hungary and as an exchange, Orban uh, gets protection from the West. Case, uh, the biggest working class movement, or if you wish, uh, the, the question of solidarity movement in Hungary was in the case of so-called slave law, the German firms denied, but in, flex, in fact, they have completed the project. They asked for the extension of overworking. Actually, 400 hours a year legally, and it will be paid. Please check it if you don't believe. After three years. So you work 400 hours this year, next year, <laughs> again the next year, and you will be paid after three years. These are the German automakers in Hungary. And who passed the law? The Orban government. 
So what? Economic Europe has defeated the political Europe. And EU indeed had an alternative. The countries had no alternative. They were too weak, and they have become even weaker uh, at the end of the uh, real years of 2000. So in the global crisis, uh, they, they just indeed collapsed in all countries. Uh, Slovenia collapsed <laughs> most. That's what. OK, I stop here. Thanks for the ally, and thanks for the critical remarks. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, here in the back. Thank you. My name is Mirjana Tomic. I have a question for Maria Škora. How do you explain the backslide in women's rights? No one here has mentioned what's happening with women in uh, uh, V4 countries, and we are like half of the population. Thank you. How do I explain? Uh, middle ages? I don't know. <laughs> no, um, yes, uh, you're right, and in particular it's a case of, about Poland where the abortion and right to abortion or um, limiting the right anyway, very restrictive right to, abo for, to, to abortion in Poland is, have been, has been a recurring topic recently. Uh, it's also about sexual education at schools that has um, provoked uh, protests on the streets. Um, I think... In case of Poland, and I will be talking only about it because that's the country where these topics are particularly present in the public debate. Honestly, I think it's scapegoating and um, looking, top, looking for topics for mobilization by the governing party. Um, I think women are women's rights are heavily instrumentalized by the governing party. I wouldn't claim that it's not also in line with a more conservative vision of family, world, gender roles, and so on and so on. But uh, my feeling is it's also winking a little bit and flirting with the f more far-right voters. Um, um, actually, for the first time, I think, uh, the, the far right has uh, enjoyed a pretty electoral um, success of six point something percent, and they're really far right nationalists right now present in the in the parliament, which, um, in my opinion, um, taking electoral uh, strategic thinking for the governing party might be uh, worrisome, and it might be just um, an attempt to reach out to those more uh, more fundamental uh, voters. Um, to, to win them for the for the win them back perhaps, but uh, on to to end on a positive note on that uh, topic, the women's right or the, the assassination or the attempt of assassinating women's right in Poland was a source of tremendous mobilization for women who, for the first time, some of them really got politicized because they saw. The, uh, how politics in action really works and how they can, it can impact uh, their lives. And two, three years ago, we saw gigantic black marches of women of all ages in small towns, big towns, uh, going on the streets and saying, well, that's one step too far. And uh, I think if there is anything Jarosław Kaczyński fears in the world is Polish women, mm -hmm. because he, you know, uh, they can really mobilize. So I had one more uh, comment. Tiuta, do you want to still? We have to, um, I'm sorry, I'm afraid we have to Thank end you. it soon. Um, yes, uh, I'd like to ask concerning the candidate countries, since I am coming from Albania. So uh, just uh, some, some days ago, uh, we had not a simple decision from the council. Uh, we actually saw uh, how uh, the fragility of the EU in itself and how the member states are having the the real power, so to say. So, and uh, the French president is um, asking for a reform within the EU. Um, here, he included uh, very strongly the the Spitzenkandidat process. Uh, and he was uh, obviously not happy with what happened with uh, his nomination, which was uh, even the first time uh, from the foundation of the EU that such a thing could happen to a founding member and to France in general. Uh, 
and maybe this is just one of the reasons, since he has pointed out before how important it is to review the whole process and to to review the the institutions of the EU. So uh, I'd like to ask to you. Um, uh, well, it, it is a bit open to all the panelists. Like, how do you see the perspectives of uh, such a region which is not appealing to the EU? Uh, since the whole uh, process is asking for an exchange, like what can the Balkan states can give in exchange, as as you see it, with uh, many issues that they may have uh, in this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to give this to Paul first and Magdalena second. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think uh, a couple of years ago it also ha happened to a designated commissioner from Italy. And, um, but it, it is true, I think I share your assessment that this is a sensible time for the French president because there's so many projects which he launched where he, he, he's not able to actually deliver on, on his promises and he's losing allies and also for domestic political reasons that was um, an, an issue for him for him because it would be difficult to argue um, if, if you if you open accession negotiations um, and at the same time argue but this is not uh, lead, this is not maybe not going to lead to an accession uh, he will not be credible um, in the domestic political arena on this issue and he wanted to avoid that. Uh, on the other hand, um, he, he also seems to be right um, stating that uh, the enlargement process has its merits but also has its problems. Um, but uh, I, I actually and, and Austria and the Austrian government see it very critical what, what uh, Macron, in particular Macron, other countries followed him on this, did. Um, but he's, um, he, he very much invested personally, invested personal energy to make sure that um, there's actually an improvement of the functioning of the European Union, that there's a deepening of the European Union, and up to this day he was not really very successful. And there are many, many member states who would rather, because it's the easy way to get, go, who would rather uh, keep, keep, keep going with the enlargement process, but block on the deepening of European integration. And without the deepening of the European integration, there will never be an enlargement, because the structures which we have today are actually made for 12 to 15 countries and not for 27, 28 or more countries, because it doesn't really work. Decision making doesn't really work. And, and there he has a point, because on the one hand, the same countries that's, that, crit, that criticize France for not giving green light uh, on opening enlargement uh, negotiations are the ones that say we have to cap the EU budget. And I mean, it's a ridiculous budget if you compare it what people actually expect and what politicians expect the European Union to do. Because it's expected to do everything, but it cannot do, to do, it cannot do everything because neither does it have the competences, nor does it have the budget to do that. And this is where he, he comes in and he says, well, we have to stop here and rethink the metho methodology and rethink what we're doing. And I'm done not defending it, but I'm just trying to, to, to understand uh, his, his point of view, which, which I don't share. Um, but with this, he, he, he probably has a point. And I think um, the, the, the candidate countries, and they have, they, they, there's a clear set of criteria which they fulfilled. So in fact, uh, th there should be green light for the accession negotiations to, to, to start. But, he's, but the European Union has to be ready too, and it's not ready, as we see. So he has, it's an internal issue, an internal conflict, and I think uh, these things need to go in parallel because if they don't go in parallel, it's a dangerous issue uh, because you, 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 you're causing many, many uh, regional challenges and problems there. But he doesn't want it to go in parallel. And if it doesn't go in parallel, you will probably lose to be 
Frank a lot of uh, many years because uh, it's unanimity in the European Union with many issues that he actually with many issues where he actually wants to advance. And there's a lot of it's, it's a, there are big conflict zones there, and I don't see um, compromises there on the horizon that would actually help um, giving help those countries which are critical with the enlargement process, giving them uh, giving green light to to restart the process or improve the process. So I'm not uh, very optimistic at the moment, but I think the ball lies with with the EU. Uh, with the EU member states and not so much uh, with, with the region in itself. Thank you. Magdalena, do you want to add something? Uh, no, have, I'm, I'm so sorry because comment. we have no time and let's people quote, are leaving already. Let's quote already uh, uh, another French president, Mitterrand. Mitterrand was ridiculized when he raised the issue that for us, what is called now the new member state should be established, a second class membership, transitory. We were very much against, and I think Mutalan was right. So now the solution of, uh, I, I think that all countries, what are called new member states, are not ripe, not mature for the full membership. Right now, they are not. So now raising the issue that in the same way, widening new members, that's uh, a nonsense, in my understanding. Something new has to be invented uh, uh, for uh, those countries in Western Balkans, uh, but not this kind of membership. So Mitterrand was right, I repeat. Which doesn't really help the countries we were talking about. Magdalena? Maybe a positive comment. So uh, from the cultural point of view, um, the countries, the candidate countries are already part of different programs of European Union and it helps to bring them uh, together uh, with another countries and also to create networks. For example, um, there are some uh, sub-programs also of Creative Europe. Uh, next month, a new program will be launched uh, dedicated to network. And I think it's extremely important to work together and the uh, approach of European Union, as far as um, I understood, it's just that not a single projects in single countries will be supported uh, with, with uh, Creative Europe, for example, but it will be always a network from, from several countries, at least three or five or more. So, um, yeah, it will be also a chance to, to, to exchange and um, what um, I also would like to add that uh, for me Vienna uh, could play or, or is already playing, but it would be it could be better a really important role or bringing um, East and West together because this is a country which is surrounded by Central Eastern European countries and it's not a part of of CE but it has a really strong historical background and cultural background. It already uh, has a lot of people living here. And uh, such uh, discussions like here on an on, on, uh, even larger scale could, could really um, help. And also don't forget culture because this is also something what brings people together when, for example, the best Albanian films or music or theater plays are um, traveling um, in the world and, and create this positive image uh, of, of a nation. I, I agree. Because I teach since 10 years in that country and I drove with my car 150,000 kilometers in, in Eastern Europe. So I don't, and I, I just want to add the comment uh, the, with you. The young people there, they really feel as European. Yeah? So I, I, I want to add just as a positive <laughs> remark, yeah? because I think most, the only one critic is I drove uh, in my own car an old Fiat 150,000. One of the critics is that all of them, they feel, the young generation, yeah? certainly I live in the academic university bubble, they feel they're really proud to be part of the European Union. But the thing is, they, one of the critics is, okay, some of these high commissioner or people come and then they leave. They don't really care of them. They don't feel that all those people stay there. 
all the academics, they were surprised that you go with your own car from Vienna to, to, to Romania or to Bulgaria. They said, wow, you are the first ever academic that you ever go with a car. I, all over Europe, I hear that because all the people come with the airplane, stay one or two days, and then they go back. So they feel like hip hop and then back. And, and that's what, what I was saying. And I teach there since 10, 10 years. Maybe some know Professor Peter Kambitz. He's more on the ÖVB. But I'm a social democrat. But I think the people, if they really realize that you take care, they, they, they really, more or less, the feedback is enormous. And I was really, I teach in Australia and all other countries. I never received such a, uh, uh, intense feedback. They really think... They, and they are really proud to be part, uh, and, and especially with the Danube Region project and other. So in, in that way, I, I in that way I'm maybe too optimistic. Yeah, maybe I'm I only see the the young people, but the, they really, for me, it was one of the most positive approaches of traveling. Uh, that the be, the young generation is really full enthusiasm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will end almost end it here because. Uh, we could win uh, Mr. Josef Weidenholzer to end with concluding remarks. Joe was uh, a member of the European Parliament for, uh, um, for uh, a couple of years uh, of uh, the Social Democratic Party of Austria. He is also a former university professor and um, always a strong supporter of civil society projects in Austria. So thank you very much. Uh, after two days, because most of us, we already met for two days, and after two hours, uh, here in this group, I must say, it was a real great experience to be together. I will not be very long because I have to catch a train, so <laughs> everything is confined. Yeah? Uh, but I think uh, we were discussing it, and nobody could really find out whether this kind of discussions happened in the social democratic context uh, for a long time. Yeah? So it is certainly quite a while ago that we had this kind of set up in our family. And I think this is very important that we found together. It was overdue because the answer is not black and white and the answer is not easy. Uh, there are a lot of problems and if you come up with Eastern Europe, people say, shut up, I don't want to hear that, and so, so this is the some, but in, in, some, in some audiences still uh, the opinion, but of course there are problems, there are big problems, we discussed many of them, uh, and many of these problems have the capacity to destroy the European project. Uh, Hungary, Poland are forerunners in this. And I mean, of course, the situation is completely different in, in every of these countries. Uh, we have a counter project which has, has been declared by Viktor Orban as illiberal democracy, which is not possible because uh, democracy is either liberal or is no democracy or is a facade democracy. We have a fence, a new fence in Europe, again in our neighbor country, Hungary. And we have also the expulsion of CAU, which did not happen for, I don't know, 60 years or something that the university academic community had to leave a country. So these are really neg negative bad news. And it looks like as if we are on a slippery slope and just going down like an avalanche. The question is, uh, have you already reached the bottom? And there are some, I would say, signals, signs, that we could have reached the bottom. These are the uh, election results in Hungary and, and Poland. We should not over-exaggerate it, but there are very interesting details about these election results. And there is the still active civil society. And I mean, if, if you... Every weekend, if you look on Twitter, you see uh, images of people in Poland, in Hungary, uh, waving European flags uh, and, and showing that they, they believe in the European project. So I would say, uh, as Attila said, uh, quoting Darendorf, uh, 
uh, it takes 60 years. So we have 30 years now. Did we reach half time? And you know that you cannot football teams, uh, football games. You sometimes win in the last 15 minutes, yeah. But at least uh, the second half is even more important than the first half. So I would say, what we need is a an, an restart of the discussion. We need a kind of round table, as it had been exercised in Poland uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago, with a spirit of. Uh, self-critic of accepting the other and it has also not only to include the, the, the political leaders it has also uh, in, uh, to include the, the business community because they are part of the problem or a very important part if you look at the case of Hungary, Volkswagen, Audi, BMW, all these companies were destroying yeah, uh, the credibility of, of, uh, of even market economy. Yeah. So, if you have this, this uh, round table, I think uh, we have to discuss together on equal footing. It's not the superior West and the East who has taken the elections. So, we should not aim to educate anybody. This is sometimes the feeling from people from Eastern Europe that they, they, they think we, we, we just want to educate them and impose something on them. No, the West has to be self-critical. Uh, we have to accept that we had been destructive, that we destroyed, if you look at East Germany, we just destroyed the East of Germany and, and the, the, the life balance of many people. Uh, we exploited labor in an incredible uh, 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 extent, uh, even we do not want to talk about this. And what we achieved is in every village of Eastern Europe, there is an Austrian ATM. Raiffeisen is everywhere. So this was our interest in the region. Yeah? It was not the people, as you said, traveling through the country, meeting people, discussing with people. So it was our ATMs. Uh, and we achieved this. But I don't know whether it was for the good or not. So uh, summarizing, I think there is no East-West divide anymore. As you said, there is a east, uh, east a West-East-East divide, I would also say there's a West-West-East-East divide. Societies are much more divided than they had been 30 years ago. This is also within the, the member states, a division, countryside and, and urban and, and so forth. Uh, second, the West is not anymore a model. The West is just as a concept uh, disappearing. What we what we used to know, our knowledge about the West is not existing anymore, if, if you look at, uh, I mean, this so-called president of the United States, this has nothing to do with the West. Yeah? So, uh, third point, but in East and West we are suffering from the same problems. Economy, environment, uh, trade policies, this was all result of a common approach already. In fourth, uh, we have something like, this is also a result of this process, an East-West constituency. We have the diaspora, more than 10 million people from the East living in the West, or there are also people from the West living in the East. So this is the new potential. And I believe that this should, social democracy should aim to get in contact with this constituency because they are to some extent also people who, who because they know two worlds, they are also open and open for, for new solutions. Social democracy, I have to be very brief, but you, you asked me to, to give an answer. Social democracy has to change dramatically, otherwise we will not uh, exist anymore. This needs a new structure, so we have to give up these top-down procedures, we have to involve members. Uh, it needs ownership, it needs to bring the movement back to the people, because we have a, a friend from, from the United Kingdom here, 
uh, E.P. Thompson wrote a great book on the, on the making of the English working class, where he explained that the working class was actually itself uh, detecting the power of the many. Yeah? This, is, this is, I think, what we have to come back. So social democracy is another evening, and, and I, I want to, don't want to go back. But coming, uh, coming to, a, to an end, um, you rightly said, Austria, I think, is a good venue for starting this kind of dialogue, which does not mean that we want to implant our ideas everywhere else. So it, it has to be on a, on a, as I said, equal footing level. Uh, and Austria, I mean, we should really accept geography. We are part of the East. And all our endeavors are all the time, no, we are not really part of the East a little bit. Yeah? Let's accept it. Yeah? We, we, are, we are, as geography tells us, in the middle of this continent, on the river Danube, and there's a lot of, of interesting developments possible. Uh, Hannes is not here for the moment, but I wanted to, uh, to share with you one, uh, one uh, experience I had exactly 30 years ago, so one, one month less than 30 years. Uh, uh, one, yeah, one, so 30 years ago, anyhow, there was a program in Austrian radio about the developments in Czech Republic, and Hannes was quoted and he said, uh, this opens up. Uh, new chances for the region and this will be a great chance for all of us. And that was together with an Austrian politician. He still is alive, but he was very influential at this time. And he said, oh God, this dreamer. I still remember that. And after 30 years and the longer it takes, I must say, I take this dream. This is a good dream. Yeah? Uh, to live in a region where we have these chances. Yeah? So let's be optimistic. Uh, there is reason for optimism. And if you still are not convinced, uh, it's just come back to Immanuel Kant, who said, optimism is a moral duty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'd like to end with thanking everybody who um, spent uh, the day here and everybody who came this evening. Um, I think we prepared some, uh, some uh, refreshments um, outside, so you are warmly welcome to stay a little bit longer with us, to have uh, a glass of, uh, of wine and some snacks and to, um, to finish the debate and yes and we hope to see you again in Vienna at the Renner Institute. Thank you. Thank you.